Well, good morning. Welcome again to University Presbyterian Church. It's uh, good to be with you this morning, uh, especially if you're visiting with us. We want to offer you a warm welcome. Uh, we are happy to have you here with us and hope that you find uh, rich fellowship both with the Lord and with his people. This morning, I want to invite each of you to open in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. We'll, uh, we'll look at a lengthy portion of Scripture this morning, uh, Galatians 5, uh, verse 1 through 15. But it's, a, it's an extended portion of Scripture that is really held together uh, by a particular theme, uh, a theme that is appropriate for Advent. Uh, and that is the theme of freedom. Freedom. You know, as Americans, we talk and we think about freedom a lot. We know that uh, freedom isn't free. We're conscious of the fact that our freedom has been purchased, was purchased by the blood and the toil, the commitment of our forefathers, that it can be lost. That liberty is something that must be protected. And these things, they, they roll around in our consciousness. We've always known them to be true. But particularly as we've come out of a pandemic, as we've gone through divisive election cycles, as we watch as war unfolds in Ukraine, we think, we talk. Perhaps you this morning find yourself even worrying about freedom. We know how valuable something like political freedom is and how carefully it needs to be protected. The world, our culture, teaches us to be consumed with that thought. But Scripture and the Apostle Paul this morning turns our attention to a completely different form of freedom. A form of freedom that even as followers of Christ, if we admit it, we find that our, our hearts and our minds are not nearly as captivated by as they should be. Freedom that is far more important far more worthy of our consideration. It's a freedom that can't be established nor threatened by political leaders. A spiritual freedom that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. A freedom that all Christians around the globe are able to experience. Shockingly, whether we live in liberal democracies or communist states. But it's a freedom, nonetheless, that many believers in Jesus Christ know little about. That we fail to experience on a daily basis. And that can indeed be lost. And needs to be protected. Ferociously protected. And that's what our passage this morning is about. A Christian's commitment and need to protect the liberty and the freedom that was purchased for him by the very blood of Jesus Christ. In this morning's passage, Paul calls us to stand firm in a form of spiritual freedom. A freedom that faces dual threats on either side. Galatians chapter 5, we'll think about this morning the beauty of the freedom that we have in Christ while thinking about the way that this freedom is constantly threatened by both our legalism and our licentiousness. Will you join me in prayer? We'll turn our attention towards Galatians chapter 5. Father in heaven, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Grant us your spirit that we may walk 
and live and enjoy the freedom of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. The Apostle Paul sees and views the Christian life as a life of freedom. In fact, this may even be the primary theme of this book, the point that Paul has been building towards for several chapters. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Jesus himself in the Gospel of John declares that this is his ministry, the reason why he has come. We're set free, given freedom by his life and death and resurrection. Perhaps for many of you, this is a strange thought. Indeed, for many of us, I think we are, we're taught by the culture to think of religion and spirituality and even Christianity, if anything, as a hindrance to our personal freedom, right? As a, as a liability to those issues. And in many cases, Christianity can be reduced to nothing but a list of do's and don'ts. But for Jesus and the Apostle Paul and really all of the authors of the New Testaments, at the heart of Christianity and at the heart of of the Christian experience is true freedom. True freedom. But, but what is Christ talking about? What is Paul talking about? What kind of freedom does Scripture have in mind? Because the Apostle certainly isn't talking about our modern notion of religious liberty. Nor is the Apostle talking about the right to do and to say and to live any way I please. So what is Christian freedom? What is the freedom for which Christ has set you free? And we've seen this throughout the book of Galatians. I hope that you recognize it on many levels. Throughout Scripture, we are continually taught that we are, in fact, slaves. Much like the Israelites before us, we might be quick to say, well, I'm not a slave. I've never been a slave to anyone. Strange view of Jewish history, especially as they are living in that moment under Roman occupation. But we, too, in our sinful estate, often fail to recognize the fact that we live as slaves. We live as slaves to the flesh, to the devil, to sin. Life apart from Christ is a form of invisible spiritual slavery. And the declaration of the gospel is that Jesus has come to liberate us, to set us free from the power of death and hell. To be united to Christ is to be set free from the most powerful and the worst forces that hold us in oppression. And at the center of that is the very concept of sin. When we are told that we have been set free, Scripture first and foremost has in mind that through Christ we have been set free from the power of sin. Sin no longer has mastery, no longer has control or dominion, power over us. Apart from Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit, in fact, we are slaves slaves to the forces of sin. 
We have no power to resist the desires of the flesh. But second, at the heart of the gospel is the fact that through Jesus, not only have we been set free from the power of sin, but we've been set free from the penalty of sin. There is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You're free. You are free to live without shame in your past decisions and choices, the mistakes that you have made. You are free to live apart from the massive weight of guilt and regret. Christ bore the penalty of our sin in his body for this very purpose, that not only would the power of sin be broken, but the penalty of sin and all that follows it would be removed. As Christians, we are men and women who should be living in the freedom and the joy of the gospel. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we have been set free. Free from death, free from hell, free from the power and the penalty of sin. But there's one more element of spiritual freedom that we've seen throughout the book of Galatians. We have also been set free from the law. Those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ are free from the law. Free, yes, from the penalty and the curse of the law, but also free from the oppressive force of the law as a system. Now remember, Paul has argued from the beginning that the Mosaic law was never intended to save the people of Israel. The law was actually intended to do the opposite. It was intended to enslave the children of Abraham, to serve as a guardian leading them to faith in Messiah. The law shows us our sin and inability. The law, in that sense, was never meant to give life. The law was intended by God to bring death, to help reveal the fact that we are slaves to spiritual forces and powers. But now that Christ has come, the Apostle Paul has told us we no longer live under the guardianship of the Mosaic Law. So Christians in the first century, Christians today, are free from the yoke of the law. And, and this is at the heart of Paul's very appeal. Stand firm, therefore. Do not return again to a yoke of slavery. The oppression of the Mosaic law. We, we see this if we continue in the text. Look at verse 2. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision... Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. These are not new themes in the book of Galatians, but, but this is perhaps the strongest language that we have heard yet from the Apostle Paul. He says if we trade in our spiritual freedom, if we seek to improve our standing through circumcision or to be justified in any way by the law, not only are we voluntarily returning to a life of slavery. But Christ will be of no advantage. We'll be under obligation to keep the whole law. 
and we will find ourselves severed from Christ. You can hear the Apostle Paul's exasperation. He cannot believe that after being set free from the law, the Galatians are now tempted to turn back to it. And he contrasts this way of thinking with the life of faith. You'll notice this in verse 5. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Beloved, we need to understand this, that our righteousness, our standing before the Lord, is not rooted in our performance. It's not connected to what we do in any way. Paul says we ourselves await, we hope for another righteousness. Christian righteousness is, as Martin Luther said, an alien righteousness. A righteousness that comes from the outside, that is imputed to us and received by faith alone. We don't need to make ourselves righteous through obedience. Rather, we eagerly wait. We patiently wait. The hope of righteousness. You know, previously Paul taught us that we do not need to fear the condemnation of the law. And why is that? Because on the one hand, Christ became a curse for us. And on the other hand, he, through his obedience, has secured the full blessing of the law on our behalf. Paul draws these thoughts together and reminds us that as Christians, our righteousness now doesn't come through our own work but rather is a righteousness that comes from heaven through the work of Jesus Christ. You know, I think it's so tempting for us to think that our obedience, our effort, our work make us more righteous. No matter how many times we hear the gospel, our default position is to go back to go back to some form of legalism, some form of works righteousness, some form of circumcision. Something that is able to prop us up. Above one another, in the eyes of the Lord. The scripture makes it clear time and time again that our good works even our good works are but filthy rags. We cannot do anything to become more righteous or improve our standing before him. And thankfully, we don't need to because we have been clothed in the righteousness of another. As Christians, we eagerly wait the hope of righteousness, a righteousness that comes from the outside. This is why Paul can go on to say, for in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters for anything, but only faith. Faith working through love. That very phrase will become the central theme to this whole text. We'll return to it as we get near the end because it is tied to Paul's other concern. Not simply that we as followers of Jesus live in our freedom by battling and resisting the lure of legalism, 
but that we would live in the full freedom of Christ by battling and resisting the lure of licentiousness. The desire to gratify our flesh. But first, look at how Paul continues his argument. Verse 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? The image here is who, who stepped in front of you? Who, who blocked you? It's, it's a runner who's running a race. He has plenty of energy, plenty of endurance, when all of a sudden an, an, an obstacle from the outside has come in. Verse 8, the apostle says, this persuasion is not from him who calls you. It's not from the Lord. And even a little leaven leavens the whole lump. But I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. The Apostle Paul, for the first time in this letter, actually expresses the deep optimism and hope that he has. The reason that he is writing this letter, a letter that from the opening verses is penned in what sounds like desperation, is because he has great hope that the God who began a good work in them would bring it to completion. That this is not the end of the Galatian story, that they will see the folly of their way. And he expresses that hope now. But he also reminds them that even a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You only need a tiny amount of yeast to make the dough rise. And even a little bit of self-righteousness, of spiritual pride, can affect the whole Christian life. And indeed, as we see in Galatia, the whole Christian community. Salvation from beginning to end, if it is based on grace through faith in Jesus Christ, is completely at odds with the leaven and the yeast of the Pharisees. Spiritual pride. Self-righteousness. self Sufficiency. Faith and works, as we've heard throughout the book of Galatians, cannot be mixed. Those who trust in the law are obligated to keep the whole law. There's, there's no middle ground. Paul says that whoever is trusting in circumcision and, and forcing others to be circumcised, might as well go ahead and completely castrate themselves. Did that, did that catch you? Now, he's being sarcastic, of course, but he's pointing out the complete insanity of the Judaizers' position and the complete insanity of our own self-righteousness and pride. When we begin to pat ourselves on our back for the good works that we do. If you think that circumcision, if you think that circumcision improves your righteousness and standing before God, then don't stop there. Go all in. And that's literally where he ends his argument against legalism. Boom. That's it. This really brings his first and main concern to a close. The thing that he has been talking about now for five chapters. He wants us to appreciate the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And he wants us to aggressively 
aggressively protected. Do not let the leaven of the Pharisees, of legalism, creep in. UPC, don't don't let it make you a slave. Because make no mistake, we will bite and devour and consume one another through self-righteousness and pride. Rather, Paul wants the Galatians, he wants us to live in and to enjoy the freedom, the freedom of the gospel. Nothing will steal your joy more than the thought that God's love and acceptance for you is conditioned upon your obedience, your observation of the law. That his love for you rises and falls based on the level of your spiritual performance for the day. We burden ourselves with guilt. We burden ourselves with shame. We exhaust ourselves with rules and regulations. And we do the same for others. We worry and we fret when God simply wants us to enjoy the freedom, the freedom of the gospel. He wants us to rest in the full and the sufficient work of Jesus Christ. And beloved, as a pastor, that's what I want for you. But as I mentioned, Paul has another concern. And and, and he he turns now our attention, uh, not just in this passage, but really for the remainder of the book of Galatians in a completely different way. Finishing his argument against the dangers of legalism, he reminds us that the remedy for legalism is not what we call licentiousness. It's not the idea that we can now live and do whatever we want. In fact, his proponents accuse him of this. Paul wants to make sure that we do not lose our gospel freedom, but he also wants to make sure that we do not abuse our gospel freedom. And that's the theme that is picked up in verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite, if you devour one another... Watch out that you are not soon consumed by one another. You can see the the parallelism in this passage, verse 13 and verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. You have been called to freedom. Paul is concerned, once again, that we experience, that we enjoy the full freedom of the gospel. But he reminds us there are two threats here that we have to be aware of. Yes, one is legalism, and much of the book of Galatians has been an argument and a a battle against legalism. But the other is licentiousness. Not only do we have to be careful that we do not lose the freedom of the gospel, we have to be careful that we don't abuse the freedom of the gospel. Of the gospel. You know, when we hear about the freedom of the gospel, we might think, or perhaps you fear that other people think, wow, I guess that means I can do or I can now live any way I want. Do, say, watch, whatever I want. I can treat people however 
I want. But this attitude couldn't be further from the mind of Christ. And what we see in the remainder of our text this morning is that the Christian freedom, the freedom for which Christ set us free, is not, is not freedom to indulge the flesh. It's not license to sin. We have been set free, remember, from the very power of sin. As Paul asked in the book of Romans, why, why in the world would we continue in it? Why would we turn back to it? That's simply another form of slavery. Just as bad as any slavery to the law. Now we're simply in bondage again to the desires of our flesh. Christian freedom doesn't mean that I can satisfy all the cravings of my flesh. No, when, when Paul uses this word, the, the flesh is our fallen human nature, our sinful desires. And Christian freedom is the declaration that I now have power to resist the flesh. You now have power to say no to the flesh. And this is a power that you never had through the law. The law never, never gave you the power to say no to the cravings of the flesh. At best, it could show you how sinful your cravings and desires are. Through the Spirit of Christ, we have power. Power to say no to the flesh. But we also see that the Christian freedom is not only not freedom to indulge the flesh, but Christian freedom is not freedom to exploit our neighbor. I cannot use my freedom. I cannot demand my freedom in ways that harm, abuse, or even simply overlook the needs of others. Paul warns the Galatians that if they abuse their freedom in this way, man, they won't last long as a church. They'll simply bite and devour and consume one another. The rich and the powerful and the strong will rise to the top. Sadly, we have all seen this, even in the church. Men and women who use the cloak of the gospel to do as they please, to use others for their purposes, who justify any and all actions with a reference to the grace of God. But that is not the picture of Christian freedom. No matter where we look in the New Testament, we see the exact same theme. The grace of God does not lead us to live a life of selfishness and self-satisfaction. Nor does the grace of God and the gospel ever promote and encourage an attitude in us in which we demand that our rights and our privileges be acknowledged. It's actually just the opposite. It produces a spirit of self-sacrifice and the willingness to lay aside our rights, and our privileges, and our freedoms for the sake of another. And we get this, I think, right? We know that sin at its core is selfish, right? That sin is what turns us inward. And that everything in Christ and everything in the Christian gospel is meant to do the opposite. 
to turn us outward in love towards God and towards others. In fact, you may even think and you may even look at Christian liberty as one of the greatest paradoxes of the entire Christian faith. True freedom, spiritual freedom, the freedom for which Christ has set you free, actually means willing servitude and service to God and others. That is what Christ has liberated us for, right? We've been saved from sin, from its power and penalty. We have been saved for something. For the service and love of others. This thought wraps us all the way back around to verse 6. Remember where Paul told us that the only thing that matters is faith working through love. What Paul is telling us is that genuine faith always leads us to love God and others. The Reformers put it like this, we are saved by faith alone, but that faith is never alone. Genuine faith produces deeds of love. Our love for others certainly doesn't earn us any of God's favor. We don't need to earn that favor. We already have it in Jesus Christ. But it's the very evidence of a real and vibrant faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, this love is not only the evidence, it is the very fruit of genuine faith faith. True faith. True faith naturally and always demonstrates itself in love. Biblically, love is seen as a voluntary service, willing self-sacrifice for others. I know that many of you have been watching the World Cup uh, unfortunately, the, the U.S. Uh, stand in the tournament has come to a close, uh, but it's brought our attention to the world of soccer. Uh, and and one, of, one of the beautiful stories in the world of soccer uh, is Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, probably one of the best players in the world. He's made millions uh, playing for different soccer clubs throughout his career, but he grew up in complete poverty. Uh, and a few years ago, uh, the world was actually captivated to learn uh, that even in his mid-30s, he still lives with his mom. Better yet, his mom actually lives with him. Why is this? And uh, one, one reporter actually pressed him on this. He certainly has enough money to buy her her own place, her own house. And when asked by a reporter about this, his response was this. My mother raised me by sacrificing her life for me. She slept hungry so I could eat at night. We had no money at all. I think as long as I live, she will always be by my side. She is my refuge and my greatest Ronaldo knows that he owes his life. Even his very soccer success to the sacrifices that his mom willingly made. She gave up everything for him. And now he takes care of her. Not out of duty or the desire to get anything new from his mom but out of deep gratitude and love. And it's a perfect picture of the Christian's motivation for love and obedience. We are led to love God because we have already been deeply loved by Him. 
We are led and enabled to serve one another because we have already been served by Christ. Everything we have is a gift from his hands. We are who we are. We are where we are simply because of him. And as Christians, we don't think, okay, God will love me more if I do X, Y, or Z. Rather, we, we, we think, I can do X, Y, and Z because God has loved me. And he sent his son to die for me. And in Christ Jesus, I have everything that I need. That's the logic of Paul. That's the logic and the beauty of, of Christian obedience and righteousness. You know, these last few verses contain a, a bit of irony if you think about it. Verse 14, Paul says, The whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Remember earlier he, he told the Galatians that uh, anyone who accepts circumcision is required to do what? Keep the whole law. Something that he implies that no one could actually do. But now with a little bit of a wink, he reveals that the whole law is actually fulfilled through love, through faith, working through love. We keep the law, not through legalistic formulas, but through sacrificial love fueled by faith. Beloved, you have been set free from sin. But you have been set free for a purpose. In order that you may serve one another in love. Protect your freedom. Protect the freedom that you have in Christ. Do not lose it to legalism. But don't abuse it. Do not use your freedom to gratify the flesh and to demand your way. But like Christ, let us serve one another. Would you join me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we do pray that you would help us to this end to learn increasingly to put you and the needs of others first in our life, even as you put our own needs first in the life of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.